So, as you heard, for 20 years now, I've been a philosopher of science, supervising groups of students and researchers in their interdisciplinary research projects. In addition, I have been committed to diversity and inclusion initiatives within and outside of academia for over 10 years now. Now I've become increasingly convinced that it is necessary to integrate interdisciplinary science with diversity and inclusion if we are really to bring these together to produce robust solutions to the complex problems we are facing. Complex problems like the migration crisis, global warming, and the pandemic that we survived the past few years. Now, I'm asking you to bear with me for a couple of minutes when I'm using these words interdisciplinarity, diversity, and inclusion. As you may think, I'm one of those woke hipsters or a fancy advertising guru trying to sell you some cheap solutions. However, I'm really very serious and committed about this. Because if we want to develop solutions that don't break down as soon as they enter the ivory tower of our research lab, or the government chambers where policies are made, then we need to bring these three words together, these three perspectives, interdisciplinarity, diversity, and inclusion. But what then is a robust solution? I'm going to explain that to you right now. There it is. So, Mother Nature has bestowed us with many organs and parts of our bodies in two folds, making sure that they don't break down uh, when facing the risks and dangers of an ever-changing environment. So, if we lose one eye, we still got another eye to see more or less. We've got two kidneys, two lungs, and even if we lose a leg, we can still move around, even if in a lesser, a lesser degree than before. However, since these lungs and kidneys, etc., share many physical properties, they are vulnerable to one bacteria or virus, as we all know. So airplane designers had a much better opportunity to create an automatic pilot system that is even more robust than our bodies. Because what they did is use not just one form of hardware and software when making the backups of the automatic flight control system in the airplane. Instead, ideally, they use different hardware systems and different software systems, making sure that any particular hardware failure would not affect all three systems equally. And similarly, a software bug wouldn't affect all three systems equally. So with this plurality of backups, they made sure that the system is much more robust than it would be if the system would be identical. So a robust solution to a complex problem should similarly depend on a plurality of knowledge perspectives as well, as I will argue, social perspectives. During the pandemic, we have seen that some solutions that were introduced by governments were actually not so uh, robust as they hoped to be. For instance, many governments expected that all of their citizens would take the same rational decision and get their vaccination. What they underestimated was the diversity of the groups and minorities in their societies, and that not all of these groups were equally in favor of vaccination. For instance, religious and political groups didn't accept the vaccination mandate as they felt that the government was not to interfere in their health condition or play for God, for that matter. Also, minority groups with their histories of being dis disrespectfully treated or even inhumanely treated by previous governments declined the vaccination invitation because of their distrust in their governments. What is important to realize is that with such limited compliance by the citizens, 
the measures that the governments introduced were much less effective than they would have been if a diverse society would comprehensively accept the solution. So the example of vaccination showed how a solution that turns on, uh, that builds upon ignorance or limited knowledge will in itself also be fragile. So when is knowledge actually more robust? Well, take the picture here. If we want to get to develop a theory, an adequate theory on a particular causal structure in the world, like the development of a pandemic, we want to develop a robust theory of it, we need several independent lines of research that each separately develop a model of the trajectory of the pandemic, for instance, using different theories, different methods, uh, creating different sets of data. The eventual theorem about the pandemic, for instance, is much more robust than if it would just depend upon a single line of research. So if an epidemiologist creates a model of the development of the pandemic and he teams together with a social scientist with her insight in the social connections between people, then together their result will be much more robust than uh, otherwise. However, as we have seen, governments and their medical advisors sometimes really focused on a single definition of the pandemic, a medical definition of the pandemic. And as a result, they were surprised that when they introduced their solutions, they didn't expect the enormous socioeconomic impacts and the impact on the psychological well-being of their citizens of a measure like, for instance, the lockdown that we're seeing in this picture of Amsterdam, Dam Square. Due to, due to this fragile knowledge base, the solutions that the government developed, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, turned out to be much less robust and not face the compliance of their citizens. Instead, they were surprised by the resistance of the citizens shown in illegal gatherings, protests, and other avoidances of the policies. So this is why we need solutions that are based on interdisciplinary research, but also uh, take into account a diversity of social and normative perspectives. Include these in the overall knowledge and solution to the problem. Because a robust solution should not only be scientifically robust, but should also be socially robust. And given the social diversity of us all here, of people, we all have our own lived experiences. We have different sets of norms and values. We have different expectations and attitudes towards the government, for instance. And all of this will also lead to differences in our behaviors. So preparing robust solutions, we need to accommodate not just the scientific robustness, but also social robustness. And this can sometimes lead to a surprising situation where we need for a robust solution to take a solution that is scientifically speaking, for instance, from a medical perspective, not the best solution, perhaps suboptimal, but given that this suboptimal solution is more acceptable by larger groups and different groups in our society, the net result of it will be much better than if the medical advisors would convince the government to pick the best medical solution a solution that many groups in the society will resist to or uh, decline. This is the reason why we need to integrate both the scientific and the social diversity of perspectives. 
So interdisciplinary science is important, but it's not the only ingredient. But let me explain to you what interdisciplinary science actually is. So in our textbook, Introduction to Interdisciplinary Research, we present interdisciplinary research as a mode of research in which a group of scientists typically employ different lines of research using different theories, methods, models, tools, data sets, etc. When they are trying to answer a problem or develop a solution to a problem that is too complex and too broad to be covered by just a single discipline. Key to interdisciplinary research, however, is the element of integration. These different lines of research should be integrated if indeed the knowledge that we gain from this is robust under different conditions in the world outside of the uh, research lab or indeed when it is presented to different groups of people. Now the integration that is key is not always easy as we will also see in a moment. Why do we need to integrate all these different lines of research? Well, I can explain that by referring to this picture representing another complex problem that we're facing today, global warming. As you can see, this picture contains many different causal factors represented by the different arrows. The size of the arrow designs the contribution of this particular factor to the overall phenomenon of global warming. Some larger, some smaller. Some arrows refer to atmo uh, atmospheric processes, other to human processes, the humans as well, contributing to this phenomenon. For instance, a chemist might investigate the contribution of methane in the atmosphere to global warming. And a political scientist or a social scientist might investigate farming, desert desertification, and human meat consumption. Now, what is important to realize for a complex problem like global warming is that many of these factors don't function independently from each other, but instead are interacting with each other in many complex ways. To give a simple example, methane is perhaps mitigated, or the effect of methane can be mitigated by chemists' solutions or interventions in the atmosphere. However, if farming and human meat consumption continues to increase, the contribution of this chemist's solution will be more or less neglected or denied by the fact that our meat consumption is still increasing. So the interaction of these factors again show the necessity to bring people together in a room and to, to together develop a robust insight in the problem to produce a robust solution to it. However, just bringing people into a room often does not do the trick. Take, for instance, the example of this picture. The three colored heads can be considered different scientists, each of them from a different uh, discipline, bringing their own theories, methods, expectations, data sets, etc. Each in a way representing a piece of the puzzle that only when put together will really provide a comprehensive insight in the problem and as such perhaps contribute to the development of a robust solution. The three colored heads can all be also be considered stakeholders into the problem. Citizens, clinical personnel, government officials, patients. They have their own lived experience, as I mentioned before. They bring their own norms and values to the situation. And these also need to be taken into account if we are to develop a robust solution. As I mentioned, what they need to do is reflect upon their own contributions, their own pieces of the puzzle, and also on those of others. Now, this 
might seem a bit challenging because often we don't really reflect so much upon what we know or what, what, what we hold dear. Many of the assumptions that we as scientists harbor, for instance, or many of the norms that we as citizens have are left implicit. They are to us so natural that we hardly reflect upon them. Now, the good thing to know is that research shows that particularly in diverse teams, it is much more easy to reflect upon these elements and to learn about your own preferences, your own assumptions, than if you would do that in a homogenous team. Indeed, due to the confrontation with people with surprisingly different attitudes and knowledge bases, in such a situation, we are also reflecting easier upon our own assumptions, our own uh, perspectives. In other words, if you are facing a complex problem, you have to bring together a lot of people into the room if you are really interested in developing a robust solution. You need to have different scientific perspectives in the room. You have to have different stakeholder perspectives in the room with the different uh, uh, attitudes and norms and values. And together you have to engage in this challenging but really fascinating process of individual and joint reflection. The nature of our minds and of our attitude is such that we can't do all of this just by ourselves, even if you think you're a very interdisciplinary person and you are open to a variety of perspectives. No, we need to have the plurality of persons in the room. Now I'm aware that in this audience many students and colleagues and friends share some of this. Many of you are interested in interdisciplinary science and many of you are also engaged in diversity and inclusion initiatives. What I've argued here is that it is really a valuable challenge to bring these two arenas together. As engaging in a diverse group in a challenge like this will yield a very motivating, inspiring and really fun experience. And you know what? Together you will produce much more robust solutions as a bonus too. Thank you so much. <laughs>